thank you paula and uh, thank you all to thank you to all the organizers uh, for uh, giving the opportunity to give these uh, two seminars and i'm really glad to uh, to hear like your questions so really please feel free to interrupt me paula if there is a, or whoever uh, if if you're also monitoring the the chat uh, and I am missing some questions and you'd like you think it's appropriate that I re reply immediately please let me know I, I will uh, check it for you yeah and yeah don't, I, don't feel obliged but I mean and also okay. like yeah I wish we, we could meet in person but probably like next year so yeah. um yes so I think we're a bit switching gears from uh, uh for sure Peter Graham's talk and I would say like all of the talks from uh, from from this session, and um, I'd like to speak about uh, a bit of tooling uh, of science, and this is also affecting quantum science and what is now called quantum technology. And as um, it was introduced by Paola Verrucchi, I work at a nonprofit organization called uh, Unitary Fund, which is also involved in, uh, in a DOE, ENFN and uh, um, collaboration called the SQMS, uh, focusing on uh, uh, superconducting uh, quantum uh, materials uh, and, uh, um, and cavities. And so I, I will briefly introduce Unitary Fund, the sort of like community activities and in-house research we perform and uh, provide a very brief overview of uh, how quantum technology is connected to open source software and then diving into a bit, uh, well, some, some things that may be uh, clear to many of you, uh, hopefully with some new notions. And then a, a part that is a bit more hands-on, this is sort of like a um, short seminar, so it didn't look like appropriate to uh, dive hands-on on, uh, on, on, on tooling, but uh, you know, there's uh, all the information to uh, to build your uh, your own software package uh, with these recipes. About Unitary Fund, um, as it was mentioned, it's a US-based uh, charitable nonprofit that has, has the, which has as a mission uh, making the quantum technology ecosystem as open as possible. And this is because uh, uh, we believe that that's a way uh, through which uh, uh, this community uh, will be better and will also like perform better. So we work in a sort of a hybrid way. So we have a, a series of supporters. Some are personal supporters and uh, so like, like persons, but uh, mainly uh, we rely on co corporate sponsors. So here on the left, you see some uh, um, known names uh, in technology, consulting, uh, and also like uh, um, institutional names uh, in publishing, um, but also like startups that now are fairly large in the quantum computing ecosystem. And then we also have a, a series of partners. I did mention the SQMS uh, uh, collaboration. It I find is also like a, a area thrust in another department of energy funded uh, multi-year collaboration and here on the right you see uh, some of our partners so i will speak more about uh, the, um, the research we're doing with these partners uh, uh, next tuesday so who is unitary fund it's a uh, it's a small team that is is growing and uh, uh, we are all fully remote it was funded by will zhang just a bit uh, a bit more than three years ago and uh, uh, with the idea that uh, really open source uh, should play um, a role bigger and bigger in this space. And uh, um, I'm joined uh, uh, by an amazing technical staff, uh, Sarah Kaiser, Andrea Mari, they're all experts uh, uh, with a lot of experience in, in open source software development. And uh, Ryan LaRose, uh, Ben Stranomy, and Russo too. Then and Vincent recently joined us. So th 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 that's the core team. That's a team that performs the, the, the research day to day. Uh, then we have like a more extended sort of like uh, family ecosystem. 
So there is an advisory board of 15 volunteers from, from these uh, entities that you see on the bottom left that helps us uh, uh, perform better our community activities. And mainly you see these grantees from 21 countries. Well, th that's sort of like a, a community member is a more extended community, which you can also join on our Discord server. So if you just uh, type in the URL discord.unitary.fund, uh, your favorite browser, you will, you will get access to this sort of like open Slack, uh, which is Discord that is used by gamers, but also open communities. And what are these grantees and what are our grants? So uh, basically, as I briefly mentioned, there's, there's one part of this research, which we call Unitary Labs. And we do research uh, uh, on we, using open source software and developing it. Uh, but Unitary Fund really started as a, uh, a, a experiment, as a project by Will, to give rapid grants of $4,000 for ecosystem development and uh, mainly focusing on uh, making all quantum technologies as open as possible. And these align very well with open source software. It is not just open source software. I want to emphasize this. We also fund communities. We would like to fund more open quantum hardware efforts and uh, anything that, uh, you know, it's not, that doesn't fit in well into what, uh, uh, institutional entities uh, fund. So we give a fair amount of grants to date, but still the, what is impressive to me is that the order, the magnitude of the funding, it's comparable to maybe like a couple of PhD students, especially in the US. If you, the US it's, uh, if you don't look at net, but you know, what, what's the cost for the university or national lab, it's even less than that. And, and then we had this, these really amazing activities and impact. More than 10 publications, more than 30 open source libraries or so software packages uh, to which more than 50 contributors um, uh, have developed. And, and, and then a method that we really like, which is 12 folks that are now working full time in this so called quantum industry that got their first thing as a, as a Unitary Fund grant. So if you are into building things, uh, uh, do not hesitate, go on unitary.fund and, 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 and look at what, what's like the application like. It's very simple. It takes like, uh, uh, it requires like a two minute video and then you fill it out in five minutes. And of course, like if you have something that you care about that you would like us to support you, uh, then the advisory board will, uh, will, will review the application. Uh, in the next talk, like next week, I will focus about like the core research that we do at uh, Unitary Fund, which is uh, focusing around Mythic, which is the first open source error mitigation compiler. So there is, there is a big problem that it's uh, uh, popping up also in these talks, which is like how to protect uh, the fragility of quantum information in quantum computation and beyond. And, and there is a, uh, an approach that um, it's very well scalable uh, it's so-called fault tolerant, but it's not applicable now, which is error correction. And then there is now this sort of like hybrid techniques that we can employ now. Certainly they're not like the solution in the long, long run, but they enable to improve what's happening now. And this is called error mitigation because errors are just reduced. It's a mitigation of the impact of errors. And then I'm also like the lead developer with a with an admin team of Qtip, the quantum toolbox in Python. And I will speak more about these, uh, uh, these tools for the mitigation and simulation of, uh, of, of quantum uh, uh, computing devices. Quantum Qtip is actually even more general for open quantum system simulation and dynamics uh, uh, next week. Just to give you like a brief overview before talking about what's open source and how can you contribute, what are these microgrants like? So here are three examples. One is a QRAC. So this is this was uh, done by actually Dan, who's actually one of our teammates. Is a GPU accelerator quantum simulator that, if you maybe squint a bit, if you look, where it did perform better than Google and IBM simulators. So it's actually simulating what the quantum computer would do on classical hardware with uh, massive parallelization taking uh, 
making use of uh, graphical processing units and so on. So that, that is something that we helped fund and uh, Dan was a quantum hobbyist. So he, he's a soft, he was a software uh, engineer before starting with Unitary Fund and, uh, and really picked up the, the quantum tech bug as a hobbyist. Um, QNET SIM instead, it's, it's more general. So we don't only fund quantum computing. QNET SIM is a project started by Steven Diadamo and um, it's a simulator of a quantum internet. So just like uh, um, the ARPANET uh, was a few nodes uh, uh, worth back in the, uh, in, uh, several decades ago, uh, that's the same for the quantum internet. So we need to uh, lay down optical fiber. In some cases, it would be like satellite uh, connection. But then it's, it, it's also used to simulate how these protocols will work and also to add a layer of simulation that takes into account the physics of the devices, actually also using Q-tip. So QNET SIM is a plugin of Q-tip. And, and that, that, that's, a, that's a really uh, common thread, how this environment can, can work, ecosystem can work together, the, uh, will cause this quantum jungle, just because uh, uh, reinventing the wheel from scratch is not, is, not, um, is not efficient and we need to build upon other tools. And then there is, a, there is a OLSQ, which was a, a tool done by a PhD student in California, Daniel Tan. And it's actually um, a compiler that performs better than many other compilers. So here on the bottom right, you see a table benchmarking QAOA, which is one of these uh, hybrid algorithms that now it's, um, uh, it's used for, for many, um, for many benchmarks. And you see that uh, these OLSQ um, um, metrics perform better than state of the art. For example, Ticket is a open source compiler by Cambridge Quantum Computing. But this was done just by a single student and it, on many metrics it's comparable. Then there is a, another example I want to make. It's a PyZX, which is a Python uh, toolbox using ZX calculus to help synthesize um, more efficient uh, quantum programs, uh, which take the form of these uh, quantum circuits, which you see here in a snapshot from a paper from other researchers that you see on the bottom right. It's a group based in Japan, is a physical review X paper from last year. And actually they, they did use Pi ZX to do things more efficiently for their new technique. So yeah, this was just you know a, a short gallery, but if you go on the grants section of the Unitary Fund site, you see like uh, all of the grants have, have been given out. And actually by design, quantum computing uh, companies and um, researchers decided to really leverage uh, open source software. And this is a collection of, uh, of uh, headlines from the from, uh, from newspapers or you know, the newspaper side of, uh, of famous journals uh, from a few years back about uh, really the effort that was in place in, in this technology transfer. And, uh, and most of these players are taking open source uh, and cloud access as a way to really reach the largest possible uh, community of developers and users, and also to make their tools more robust. It's also a way to increase the number of folks that then help make these tools um, more uh, robust. And here in the bottom, you see a, a, a review by the late Peter Vitek and Mark and Thomas, who are actually co-founders of the Quantum Open Source Foundation and uh, with whom we, we, we designed the, the Vitek Prize for, um, for open source software. And, uh, and also our advisory board members of a uh, unitary fund. So what's out there in, uh, in quantum technology and quantum computing? So I guess that many of you may know quantum computing libraries because they're, uh, they're all over the place and they have uh, usually uh, large startups or corporate uh, sponsors. There's also like uh, earlier history of, uh, of uh, open source libraries that actually 
um, sometimes did not uh, uh, specifically focus on quantum computing, but on broader projects and, and problems. For example, Qtip, uh, Qnet is another example. It's a computer algebra package for quantum mechanics and photonics quantum networks. And here really there is, there is, there is a list of, of, of these packages. So open source, it's, uh, it's embraced by companies, by startups, but it's also as it's a grassroots movement that uh, is uh, it's finding uh, supporters also in academia, as, as we all know. I will speak about Qtip in my next, uh, in my next uh, uh, talk. But let me just mention that it's a, it's a sort of like a Swiss army knife for quantum uh, physics uh, simulations. So from cavity QED to dissipative systems, to spin lattices, uh, even to uh, quantum error correction uh, and, uh, and uh, quantum information processing, it's a simulator that with a laptop or uh, a cluster or even a supercomputer allows you to simulate up to a certain limit uh, what can happen given uh, rules uh, that uh, we, we think are feasible. So a series of master equation trajectory um, approaches uh, in, the, in the evolution of, of quantum systems. But now I wanted to take a step back and, uh, and, and speak about open source in general. So what's open source? Open source, it's code and software that uh, can be uh, shared according to a license. Usually it's for free and anyone can look in the source code so you can see how things are working behind the scenes and, uh, and, and you can contribute to open source. And three great examples in my opinion are Linux, uh, Wikipedia, and, and archive.org where folks can upload their, um, uh, their papers. So they, they all have their backing foundations or nonprofit organizations, just like Unitary Fund is, uh, is, is doing for, for the quantum tech uh, ecosystem. And, and it, was, it was actually estimated by a report by the Linux Foundation that uh, uh, the work done by developers on Linux uh, for free uh, was uh, worth something like $5 billion in contributed actual development costs. And I'd like to, to point out this, this quote by a writer, Neil Stevenson, which uh, really points out that uh, Linux, Unix, uh, in contrast to other closed source uh, approaches, uh, is not so much a product, but is a painstakingly compiled oral history of the hacker subculture. And, uh, and I really like this quote, uh, just because I think that uh, we're also like in, uh, in software, uh, commercial software, we're moving a bit from products to communities, which are actually very, very valuable to companies. And so getting into these communities, it's also something good, even if you end up doing data science in, in the future or, or something in the industry, or maybe in quantum industry. So today's uh, featured page on Wikipedia, at least for me, was on the discovery of nuclear fission. And we all look at Wikipedia and we all know how it works, but I don't know how many of you looked at this part here talk. And this really reminds me like what this Gilgamesh uh, epic uh, citation by Stevenson. And if you look there, there is actually question, answer, question, answer from folks that uh, actually, you know, fairly recently even uh, discuss uh, how things should be written, uh, if something it's, uh, it's appropriate, like accurate or not. And actually, if you look at the history of the page, you see all the various revisions, who were the contributors, who uh, had something to say about uh, a given revision and so on. And so this is a sort of like the behind the scenes of Wikipedia. And GitHub, if you're not familiar with it, or other uh, frameworks are the similar thing, but not just for text, not just for an encyclopedia, but for most of the open source code that then empowers software that um, includes also quantum uh, uh, applications. And I think it's really timely to, to acknowledge how the impact of open source for, for science so uh, uh, this is nextstrain.org, uh, which is a tool that is actually used uh, to, uh, to, to, do like, to, to track the genomic epidemiology 
of, uh, of, uh, of viruses such as the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. And, um, and that, that's an example of uh, what, what I, I like to think of as uh, open source science, open science, such as a science at scale because it's really, really fast. So open source software, like my, my pitch for open source software, it's that uh, uh, the basics, I did say like uh, several examples that we're using every day. One thing that it's really uh, impressive that is accelerating many and these industries such as uh, machine learning. And it's also like good for developers because by looking at code that other developers, usually like more senior developers have, uh, have, uh, have uh, written, you learn very fast. Actually, I, I usually learn uh, a lot of times by look, by Googling questions and then ending up on the Stack Overflow, which is sort of like a forum for developers and everyone does it. But that, that's, uh, that's a way you learn by, by mimicking and by imitation. As I did mention before, there is also like a uh, commercial aspect to this because how companies are looking at open source, it's really changing. So just think that uh, Microsoft, which was really against open source, uh, at least it was perceived as such, did acquire GitHub a few years ago for uh, a huge, huge amount of money. And machine learning is really pushing open source because if you want to deploy um, uh, artificial, so-called artificial intelligence uh, uh, solution uh, in production, Usually, if you want to be with a state of the art, you're not using uh, some closed source software, but you're relying on a stack of open source software. That's for business and application. For science, why is it so good? Well, first of all, yeah, I did mention uh, archive, uh, but this can go to different levels, uh, access to quantum computers, uh, access to test beds, um, access to research and uh, data. Uh, this is something that we need. We need reproducibility. And, and then there are these tools such as GitHub, GitLab, that uh, allow to uh, uh, scientists, which is one of the most global community, to collaboratively work and advance the teams, and uh, uh, advance the field. And th this is done for, for teams that actually are really scattered across the globe and usually work asynchronously. So, I'm a fan of Python, is probably the, the language, uh, the programming language I know best. And uh, here's a plot with some projections that now are kind of like uh, out of date from 2012, 2020, it's a bit cut. The, and this is actually from question on Stack Overflow, the forum I was citing before. And you see that really Python is kind of like taking over with respect to some of these major programming languages. Why is that? Uh, remember like, you know, camps like C++, Python doesn't, it's low for sure, but there are some reasons why it's also picked up so much uh, with, um, with the scientific community. And I'd like to distill it into three, three main reasons, community resources and tools. So this is now a, a picture from uh, one of the many gather, gatherings of the uh, Python uh, community. This is the gathering of scientists using Python in Europe. In 2018, it was in Trento, more recently it was in uh, uh, Bilbao, and then it's been uh, it's been halt, halted because of a, of a, of the pandemic disruptions, uh, and it's great because you know you can get into these sort of like cozy communities where folks don't are not software developers by uh, uh, as their like main expertise. They they are scientists, and they and they have to do with the same deal with the same problems, which is sometimes you know diagonal, diagonalizing big matrices or having. Uh, um, stability problems on their dynamical servers and so on, and, uh, and you can really learn a lot. So I, I encourage you to, to look for this community. There's various levels, not only in Europe, but around the world. The other reason why Python is so successful, it's because it has this uh, modular uh, stack so that you can build upon others' work just by importing packages. Actually, this is also now uh, a feature that you can find also in other languages such as Julia and, uh, and so on, which is actually specifically thought for, for uh, doing science and it's uh, growing fast, but has not reached the, 
the mainstream ecosystem that Python has. So here you see a stack which is about numerics and plotting. Then there is a, a stack that is, uh, you know, with TensorFlow Python, scikit-learn, that stuff that is used for machine learning. And then you have a stack that is uh, uh, more specific to uh, scientific applications. For example, PyRoot is a Python sort of like uh, API front end for root, which was developed at CERN for en high energy physics simulations and um, data analysis. So in the back end, Python also here on the on the bottom, I, I pointed to Cython, which is a way to use compiled um, uh, scripts in Python. And, uh, and so it's like, uh, there are sort of these bridges between C++, uh, um, Fortran and Python. And the last, the last reason why Python is so successful, in my opinion, is that it really took to the next level uh, these notebooks, an example of the Jupyter notebook. So if you're not familiar with Python, you may be familiar with Mathematica or MATLAB. And they also have this idea of this interactive uh, um, code cells and code blocks. And the cool thing is that in Python, as you can see here for, or a, a theorist is that you can write uh, in LaTeX your master equation, your equations, uh, and also you can comment uh, the top in Markdown. And so it's it's also nice, it's self-contained. And uh, actually this is what Gael Baruque, which is one of the lead developers of Scikit-Learn uh, said, it's, it's one of the tools that is taking us beyond reproducibility to reusability. And, um, and so from, from Reproducible data, which is very important in many parts of science, including medicine and biotechnology, uh, to reusable code. And sometimes the problem of data for physicists and theoretical physicists is not so uh, big because if something works, you, you find it out very quickly. Uh, but if you have a reusable code, then you can tweak the code, you can apply to a different uh, data, and then this tool becomes not only robust, not only replicable, but generalizable. And this has even led some to uh, claim or give some suggestion that uh, the scientific paper is obsolete. I, I will not go uh, as far, but uh, you know, even the books that were uh, thought dead a few, few years ago were still reading books. But uh, I do think that sometimes sharing a notebook with a, with a scientist, uh, it's even uh, more hands-on and immediate than uh, than uh, taking a lot of time uh, writing, uh, writing a paper. So, um, and then there is, this is a more, bit of a more technical slide. Actually, it's, uh, uh, I borrowed it from uh, a researcher at the Turing Institute. Uh, there is also like now a framework, all open source that you don't need to care about if you don't want to look at details, but which actually allows you to run notebook. So a code with its own software installed on the cloud. And interactively, you can modify what's going on. That's also done by Google Collab and other, other resources. Uh, but this is all open source. And also, it's very much customizable. So we do run workshop at Unitary funds, uh, Unitary Fund, workshops at Unitary Fund that um, use these technologies. And they're really effective also in the classroom uh, to share, for example, for example, the same notebook already pre-compiled with students and then let them um, go from that step to the next level. So, yes, I, I, I want to leave some, some time for questions, but uh, that, that's now the part in which it becomes a bit more hands-on and please do interrupt me more uh, for, uh, for questions. Let me, um, let me just close for to make it soundproof, okay. And uh, this is a repository that it's on my on my GitHub. So if you go on GitHub, Nathan Shama, and I just renamed it like Make Your Code Count. And it's a sort of like interactive guide, which I will go through and you can look at uh, independently. And actually this is something that we found was really effective for many of the scientists that got the micro grants from Unitary Fund. And here there is a, an outline of different stages that uh, can help you take your code that you may have written for your scientific publication uh, to the next level, to, to become a tool 
that is understood uh, and used by others and to which others co uh, contribute to. And this is the part that is very exciting if you will ever happen to, to do this, because it really gets, at least for me, to the collaborative uh, uh, part of science that sometimes uh, gets a bit lost with all these metrics about citations, paper slicing, and so on. This is really somewhere where you can get your credit. Uh, right now, it's not really picked up by funding agencies and not, not as much as it should. Uh, but um, it's really, it really rewarding. So, so the first part is open sourcing your code. If you are, if you don't have IP problems, you're doing your basic research. That 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 should be already what we do. We we publish papers and with recipes in case and, uh, and information about uh, discoveries and algorithms. And uh, and you have to format your code and learn how to develop it. In, in a way that is professional. And actually the, the professionalism that there is in science as with many things like typesetting and so on, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like the best out there. Like many companies do not perform at the level of, of that scientists do with, with, with code. But there is a really important part, which is testing, a unit testing, packaging, uh, then unit testing, on the cloud. So you have this sort of like continuous integration. So here is an example, Travis CI. CI stands for continuous integration. So you keep pushing, which is like, again, it's jargon from a developer. So you keep adding code to your to your code base. It keeps working and, uh, and, uh, and then you keep testing it uh, also on different operating systems and so on. And then very important is to document it. I will show how to use a Sphinx and read the docs. And these are amazing tools that basically do all the work for you if you do the, the previous steps uh, diligently. And um, what uh, what I also want to say is that documentation is uh, it's crucial if you want others to use your your tools. As Guido Varosum once said, he, he's like a creator of Python uh, code is uh, well I'm, I'm freely quoting, but basic code is uh, more, more often read than written. So whole aim for your code to be read by more folks than you in the future, they don't have context and you have to add that context. And then there's the final part, which is- sorry, Nathan, Nathan, sorry yes. to interrupt you, but I see a, a question, just, just a quick yeah, sure. answer to the question in chat. I mean, it's just how to contact you, but uh, if you could answer just now before Nick goes away, because yeah. I think- so, so, one way is that uh, you can contact on Discord and you can ask questions on Unitarifund Discord, uh, which is this sort of like open Slack. So discord.unitary.fund, you will find the link to join the app. You can also use your browser. Or you can send me an email at nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N, at unitary.fund. And uh, there's also my website uh, online. Uh, yeah, great. So. So the last part I was, I was speaking about, it's like distribution and publishing, because we do want things to be reproducible and uh, robust, but also as scientists, uh, we, we do want to get the knowledge for what, uh, what, what we have uh, built and, 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 and distribution actually allows us to, to reach uh, as, a, as a far a community, a user base as possible. So I want to thank Shanawaz Ahmed, who's a PhD student at, uh, at Chalmers in Sweden, was uh, interning, uh, interning at Riken with me uh, uh, a few years back. And he also helped me develop this uh, sort of like hands-on course. And actually he came up with a, <laughs> with a registered trademark, make your code count. And um, so here I get a bit more into the details and uh, uh, of these various sessions and some information about these tools. So I did mention GitHub. GitLab is another option, which actually sometimes is more popular in Europe. And it's really the way to sort of like host your code online, just like Wikipedia does on their servers. Travis CI, but actually I should mention now both GitLab and uh, GitLab have their own uh, actions, which are tools that actually test your code and allow you to write recipes in a, in a format called YML, it's not important, but it's a very simple short uh, snippet that then helps you, for example, test your code every time you make a change, every time you commit 
and you and you and you change. I did mention Sphinx. Read the docs actually. Uh, so Sphinx builds automatically the documentation starting from the from the code uh, from the code scripts. And and then you can customize it. You can add Markdown just so you can do it with the notebook, and it can look very pretty. And read the docs is uh, crucial because it it lets you just sync your GitHub repository with uh, where you're using Sphinx and, and then it hosts the, 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 the code for you. So if you go to mythic.readthedocs.io, um, I think that's uh, that's a URL, you will find the, the, the tool that we're developing in Utah Fund and you see like a beautiful uh, documentation, I hope. Remember it's like the Python package index and uh, Conda and Anaconda are two quite popular uh, distribution um, uh, software and actually, yeah, indexes where you, so Conda, it's also as a, as a part that is not so open to the community, but it has a part which is called Conda Forge, where actually anyone can uh, add their own package. And the same is for uh, Python, uh, the Python index package, uh, the Python package index. And actually, when you can just do, you know, for your laptop, pip install um, Galileo Galilei summer school code, and it will run on your computer. Hopefully, magically, it will set everything uh, uh, correctly. It will check the requirements and so on. Then I wanted to mention the Zenodo, which is a website where you can add data sets or even code. You can link it with a GitHub repository. And there you can actually kind of like crystallize the code. You can then update with the various versions. And the cool thing is that it gives you immediately a DOI, which is a bibliometric reference that you can then use to cite your code. So sometimes you don't want to, uh, now there's like many venues, especially in quantum to publish your code. Once it's, you know, commented, it has an impact and so on. But maybe sometimes you just want to cite a piece of data or code. And with Zenodo, it's sort of like an archive for code instead of, uh, of, um, of papers. Okay, so here I'm showing a bit of code. Don't get scared. We don't have time to cover what I was doing here. I was playing with some uh, uh, with some uh, super radiance. I don't know if uh, Dr. Bradley is here. <laughs> she will recognize some of these uh, names. But basically, here I just wanted to um, to show that inside this package which is, uh, by the way, it's a plugin of Qt that I, I built with uh, Shana was other collaborators. Here is a function that counts the number of key states, which are some uh, superposition states with some high symmetry that you can write with uh, also with qubits. And you have some parameters, and uh, that is the number of two-level system of qubits. And then this returns the number of key states. And the function, it's, you know, it's, it's a single line function, and here there is the return. And this part here, which is commented, it's the doc string. And as you see, this, this way of writing the doc string, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, hard, hardwired. You, you can try to adapt to a given uh, rule. So this is called like the NumPy style versus the Google style. But the cool thing is that if you leave a flexibility of writing whatever comment you want, and you choose to, you know, for example, using the words parameters, returns, and using like, you know, the space here, the indentation here, then things will build the documentation for you, uh, then telling you about the new medical states uh, and then writing all these nicely with some nice um, also markup, uh, markdown in, uh, uh, in the documentation. And this is just showing how, how the, the code can run. And this is just an example of a class. Python, it's uh, really using these uh, class objects uh, which are very powerful because you can define some properties, methods, and uh, <clears throat> and it's a really uh, useful way to bundle um, things that should should stay together in, in some sense. So another important aspect of open source software coding is version control, and Git is uh, the most popular version control system, and that's why GitLab, GitHub are all um, frameworks that do use Git. So Git is also a language. So there is a bit of a steep curve here to learn what's going on. 
And so here on the left, you see <laughs> what happens sometimes when you have several versions of a, of a LaTeX file. If you ever written a manuscript, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, actually, now with Overleaf, which is all open source, uh, it's uh, like uh, cloud access, uh, cloud uh, maintained, um, Git versioned uh, manuscript uh, collaboratory collaboration system. You can avoid this sort of like Dropbox files uh, ugliness. Uh, but it, it actually Git it works a bit like Dropbox and GitHub uh, as well. The only point is that since you're dealing with code, you don't want to mess up things. So Dropbox does everything automatically. If I change something, it will change everything for anyone who has the shared folder. GitHub, you have to ask for the permission to change. And this is sort of, you know, of the changes that you see here. These are called uh, branches or pull requests that you then open to merge back on this sort of like uh, continuous, uh, continuous line. <clears throat> and here you can always co comment the kind of like change that you did. And, uh, and this is sort of like chronologically put together. This is just a joke of the fact that when you become sloppy and you don't, you're not expressive as you should, but you actually should be as expressive as possible because then other people can understand what's going on. And the way GitHub and other uh, software like this based on Git work <clears throat> is that you have an online repository where you do your fork. I mean, this, this field is full of jargon that you, you need to get accustomed to if you haven't yet. So you have your copy and your copy first lives like on GitHub. So if you go on the project, uh, make your code count from my GitHub repository, Nathan, but you can choose to fork it. So you basically copy it and it will be on your profile uh, on GitHub. And then from GitHub, you download, you do something called Git clone, for example, Paul, or Katerina Qtip, and uh, so which is your version of Qtip, and uh, um, and 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 actually, you will find your local copy on your machine. And then the game is always into keeping the things synced. So you want to get synced with the online repository because other people are working on it. But then you may may propose changes, and then you first push to your online version. And then with this symbol, this is like you're opening a pull request, which means that uh, you're, you're asking for the uh, possibility to add your code modification to what is actually the, the standard used by everyone. And someone we, who has uh, uh, control of that uh, project will allow you to do that. So uh, basically, uh, I just want to show you, this is a sort of like how uh, the Sphinx documentation looks like, even just by picking up uh, 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 doc strings from, from the files that I showed uh, earlier. So you see it's uh, all very nicely done with Markdown. You have, uh, it looks like an online book is a nice HTML uh, uh, file. So for this documentation, there's a bit of a, a learning curve. Maybe I will not get into too many details. But uh, something to know and not get scared about is that uh, um, you just have to write something like very, you just write Sphinx quick start by downloading Sphinx. And then it will create auto automatically this sort of like uh, basic doc uh, subsystem um, folder uh, where you have this important conf.py file, which is a configuration file. And there you put the project information, for example, what's the name of the project, what is the release version, the version release. And then just by doing make HTML, this make file will use the prescriptions in this conf.py file, and it will build this very nicely looking uh, website locally, but then you can host it online with the docs. And the cool thing is that then you can set up some configuration so that every time you change some code, then this uh, uh, documentation will change automatically on your website that is also online. So I did mention a bit packaging. Again, we cannot get too much into the details here. I think for the sake of time, I would like to get some questions uh, and uh, leave time for questions. But basically, there is a setup file, so setup.py. Pix is just the name of a project I'm using as an example, which is this permutation invariant quantum solver with the DK states. And um, 
And here you just give some information to the, to the setup function, the setup file. And uh, <clears throat> for example, if you want, and, and that's enough if you want to use a, a pip install, then you will just you know, write this line of code and, uh, and basically you will have to log in on this PyPy website, but then you register the name, but then there will be a page called uh, pypy.org slash pix in this case. And then everyone will find the file there. And so by doing pip install pix, everything will be, will be taken care of by pip. And similarly, you can do this with conda forge. And the only difference is that you will do conda install uh, uh, whatever it is uh, uh, pix. So another thing that I want to point out is that uh, besides this packaging, immersion packaging, on things like uh, uh, GitHub, or GitLab, you can do releases of your software and uh, and it's very easy to do draft a new release. And basically it takes again, a bit like Zenodo, but the, the current status of a repository, which is like the folder and uh, it makes a new release and packages there, makes like a zip file and people can, uh, can download it. And as I mentioned, like you can just make, uh, turn a switch on and then you can sync this repository with something like Zenodo, so that then Zenodo will be up to date with your GitHub, and then you, you will have this DOI that you may be familiar with that you can cite, and this will, this, you, then you have the options. You can cite to a specific version, or you can cite to the most up-to-date version of your software. So that's, uh, that's the overview. It was a bit fast. I can go into more details, but I wanted to get a bit of um, of questions, so I'm, I'm stopping here and uh, looking for questions. I cannot hear you. Paul. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. Thanks a lot. So, are there questions from the students? I, I think we are uh, losing uh, some of them because of the time zone. I'm so sorry for for this, uh, but, but we we had no other way to organize than uh, having these extra slots during lunch or dinner time however so if there are questions just raise your hands unmute yourself you can do it freely or write in chat and uh, i would like to start with a question nathan because uh, i've always been a fan of open source uh, when i was a student and in the, the 90s you with the, when Unix turned into uh, sorry Unix turned into Linux, and but one thing that I've realized is that unless we take uh, an effort trying to convince institution at least to introduce students to open source or at least to in some sense uh, how to say uh, you know to, to stay on the side of open source, it's very tough. In, in a sense, I was very angry with the, with the schools where my children went because there was no way, you know, to convince the teacher to use open source um, programs. But but in general, I mean, the very same idea of open source, which is great, I think would need some support in order to be not just for some, you know, personal um, ideas, but just for the community. So do you have any idea about how to move in this direction, how to help these ideas become more, you know, uh, spread into the society? Uh, do you have any plan in that unitary fund? I don't know how it is the situation in the world. I mean, in Italy, it's just a disaster, you know? It's just either you personally decide to you know, to follow and, and study and work and try to use these uh, great open source tools like GitHub and so on, or, or you know, you, you know nothing about it. So any idea well, about this? I, I cannot speak for, uh, for schools too much, but uh, I think uh, like, uh, well, what we're doing at Unitary Fund is also at the policy level. And I'm very happy to be sitting into the uh, QIS ecosystem task force with other colleagues where we are thinking about this and we will hopefully announce some, some actions that will help sustain these efforts. And so any help from within, if someone from the collaboration can help, please do to help us do it. But that's something that is uh, it's like uh, appreciated. Uh, I would say that the, at the level of the Department of Energy, uh, there is support for open source software. So in the US, 
uh, thanks to the um, fact that national labs uh, dealt with uh, maintaining and making available supercomputing facilities. That's, that, that's been felt and, and so uh, open source has become the way to uh, write uh, and share uh, performing, high, high performing software. And so there is like efforts at the Lauren Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Lab, uh, Oak Ridge and Fermilab uh, itself. Uh, uh, we are working on it with, uh, with SQMS. Um, at the level of like academia, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but I would say that people are taking notes. So for example, I did mention uh, Gael Barroque, who was the lead developer of uh, uh, Scikit-Learn. Uh, which is this machine learning toolkit that is not like a neural network approach, it's like very standard uh, old school machine learning and very effective. And, uh, and actually it's uh, housed at INRIA, which is a sort of like the uh, National Center for Informatics in France. And they now have fellowships uh, uh, that are tracking uh, the, the maintenance of these projects that are crucial for them. So they had to get the foundation we did so with, uh, with Unitary Fund. We had uh, create a governance for QTIP, which has uh, like, you know, the paper have uh, over 3000 citations uh, um, and uh, a lot of users, uh, hundreds of thousands of downloads. And we did help uh, uh, make it easier for the community of the developers to meet, uh, to work on the project, uh, to be, involved in remote mentorship. That's also like with the, for, with the support of Moon Focus, which is a Python based uh, uh, open source foundation. And yeah, another, another example is a U, UKRI, which started uh, like a track, a fellowship that is uh, for research software engineers. So this, this figure, it's, uh, it's taking shape. And I hope we can help uh, we can help it take shape in uh, in Italy too. I mean, in Italy, for example, there is a, uh, I'm, I'm currently based in Italy and, uh, you know, there is a um, Quantum Espresso in Trieste, uh, ICTP, CISA, they all have uh, like uh, numerical uh, uh, projects that are open source. I'm sure also ENFN and many folks working at CERN also like contribute to uh, Root and other projects. Uh, we were, I mean, then just answering very quickly to, the question about school, I do think, so the, the example I, I did show for Jupyter uh, notebooks on the cloud, that's called MyBinder. And then there is this other uh, framework called the Binder Hub, where you can set your own server, either using a Google Cloud or some uh, remote server or your own server on premises. This is picking up uh, in uh, schools. And, uh, and so folks are using these uh, for the courses to really enable also remote uh, uh, interactive labs with students. And I remember like some companies that are customizing these for um, like, like CoCalc or um, uh, other startups that are really aiming also at the high school those students. So I, I think things are changing. I hope so. I'm really hoping so. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, I've seen several messages of students leaving and saying, <laughs> because yes, because it's time to go. So are there other questions for Nathan? I can make only a very short question, but you talked uh, a lot about Python, but uh, not so much about C++, at least uh, maybe I was distracted. So. Is for, for all the people like me that learn how to code in C++ but do not know how to use Python. I know that now many students are learning Python and not C++ or Root anymore. So I was wondering, what's your opinion about this in this framework of sharing all the code? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I would like to see more like courses for uh, uh, bachelor students using Python and C++ just because it can be a bit uh, daunting to use the make file and so on with uh, C++. And these tools as in Python also have uh, ideas that are really intuitive. Of course, some numerics will always be in code efficient, in like uh, in compiled language that are efficient. So 
backends will be in C++ and Fortran and so on. I think my connection is a bit uh, bumpy, so I will uh, switch off my video. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, and, and so for C++, uh, I would just say that um, I, I think it's, it, it will stay there, but uh, uh, I would see, for example, more of a future for tools like Julia, which are really focused on, on, on students and uh, sorry, on science, on science. And so you have the sort of like uh, transparency to the like uh, low level code of uh, other languages but also like uh, the modularity that you find in the Python ecosystem. So I'm not saying that C++ is dead, but I'm just saying that, for example, in quantum computing where uh, besides like simulators that really need to have efficient code, the bottleneck is the quantum side. So in the end you have like this uh, ecosystem of many parts that are moving and you want to draw from different uh, patches of this collage. And, uh, and, and Python is certainly useful because uh, it has this modularity that is uh, intrinsic in, in the language itself. Yeah, if I can comment on this, I, also, I agree. I mean, I've realized that in a, in a sense, it, it's uh, just take it as a comment, but it seems to me that C++ is sort of a strongly uh, classical language. Python has the, um, capability somehow to adapt also to uh, different somehow logics. So th there is a slight difference when you have to um, consider a quantum algorithm and Python has the capability of adapt better in a sense uh, to deal with this different logic that it's underlying the, the algorithm itself. But this is, uh, this is just a comment, I mean, I'm, I don't know if Nathan agrees and or other agree on this. Yeah, I'm not like I'm not from any camp, but I of like you know the Python camp. I just want like yeah. as ninety percent of uh, uh, of the code in quantum computing now it's that it's written in Python. Uh, I see what you. Okay, mean. so I see that we are left just uh, just a few of us. So I think we can stop here ciao caterina you can all switch on your your video if you want and <laughs> <laughs> i just yeah. use it to so, to for the door to keep it open <laughs> <laughs> i saw that you didn't even mention it in the plot so yeah yeah nothing just to say hello and thank you for this great seminar for me it was uh, really informative uh, and uh, you really shot, give me a shot in the heart when you talked about uh, Dickens Super Radiance. So just <laughs> to say hello. Okay. And I apologize if it was over time, I, I lost track of time. And uh, no, again, don't, I, don't worry, don't worry. I, mean, I, will, I will speak more about uh, dissipative uh, many body quantum systems, uh, their simulation and uh, quantum information processing and error mitigation uh, next Tuesday. Okay. Yes. There are a lot of uh, messages in the chat thank you, of people who had to leave, so they thank you and we all thank you. And uh, well, okay, I think I can close the session.